Hello everyone and welcome back. Today we're going to talk about three things. It's going to be very straightforward. Number one, we're going to talk about the pecs and their anatomy. Number two, we're going to talk about their functional anatomy. So what happens when they contract? What do they do? And then number three, we're going to figure out how we can use those first two things to actually train the pecs with specific exercise recommendations for each portion of the pec. So let's jump right in. All right, so many of you probably already know there are three distinct portions of the chest. There's the upper chest, the middle chest, and the lower chest. Practically speaking, we can probably divide the chest really just into two major bits, the sort of upper shelf and the lower shelf, but I'll talk about that later in the video when it comes to recommendations for how to set up a, your chest training throughout a week. So starting with the upper chest though, otherwise known as the clavicular chest or the clavicular pecs, these are these blue guys, right? And they basically run from the same point that the other pecs do on the upper arm up into the inner border of the clavicle. And then we have the middle chest, otherwise known as the sternal chest which is basically just the portion of the chest that runs and attaches all along the body of this sternum, which is this sort of tie looking thing right here. And then we have the lower chest, which many of you know as the uh, costal pecs or the abdominal pecs, perhaps both of those things are interchangeable. And they basically run downward toward what are known as the costal cartilages, which are basically just these things that kind of look like ribs, but are a little bit more flimsy. So very simple, very straightforward, upper, middle, and lower, otherwise known as clavicular, sternal, and costal. Now, when it comes to what each of these pecs do, it really depends on the position, but we're going to talk about each of these three different portions in isolation first. So when it comes to the upper pecs, and you know, you can think about this strategy for figuring out what a muscle does for any muscle in the body. It doesn't just apply to what we're going to talk about here, but in the context of the upper pecs, just to begin with, just think about it very, very simply. Think about, okay, I have attachment point here and attachment point here. What happens when these two things move closer together and how ideally would you move them as far apart from one another as possible? In the case of the upper pecs, what we would want to do is take the arm parallel to these fibers, right? So you can almost draw a straight line from the hand all the way down here, whoop, through the shoulder with these blue guys here. And to stretch these guys, we would be bringing the arm backward in a little bit of a wider position behind the body. And when they contract, again, point A to point B, I just bring those two things together and oops, and what happens is my arm comes somewhere this way, right? So uh, on me, what that would look like is I just navigate, find my inner collarbone, boom, biceps to inner collarbone. That's as short as that upper pec gets. And then I just trace that back to find the most stretch position. Okay, so that's the upper pecs. And from there, the middle pecs and the lower pecs should be a little bit more intuitive, right? Because all you're thinking about is attachment point to attachment point, attachment point to attachment point. And when we're figuring out um, what the function and what the functional anatomy of any muscle is, again, I think it's very helpful to start from a place of finding that shortest position first and then tracing it back from there. So if I know that I'm bringing point A to point B for the middle or sternal pecs, I'm just gonna bring my biceps over to that point, right? So on me, find my sternum, where's the sort of middle point of my sternum. I'm gonna find that point, squeeze my, my chest inward this way. And then to figure out how to lengthen it the most, I'm just gonna kind of trace those points away from one another, right? So in the same way that we went upward toward the clavicle and then we came outward and backward a little bit wider, we'll now thinking about how these would stretch the most because of the fact that these run around the rib cage as the lower pecs do as well which we'll talk about in a second we're actually going to be able to stretch them a little bit more if we look at it from this perspective if the arm is brought back a little bit tighter to the body right because again if we come up here in this territory we have some stretching going on of these fibers here right but what is actually getting more stretched in this position again are these upper fibers we obviously have stretching of these fibers in this position but what is actually proportionally getting stretched more are these fibers. So when we do an exercise and these are the fibers that are stopping the motion, right, these are the fibers gonna, that are going to be pulling us out of that position. Right? So it's really about sort of what proportion of the pecs are contributing in either position. It's not, we can't just consider them in isolation. Okay, so to stretch these middle guys the most, again, we find that short position and then we just find, okay, where can they stretch out the most? It's going to be somewhere that's kind of, you know, in this position right here, arm a little bit tighter to the body for the reasons we just listed. And then last but but not least, we have these lower pecs. Again, find that shortest position somewhere down here. What well, the guide uh, point that I like to give people is just think about like kind of aiming for your nipple or something along that point, right? And that kind of just generally looks like squeezing biceps toward nipple, right? That's the shortest that those guys are gonna get. And now again, what do we do from this point? 
Will we basically just trace this up and say how far or really where can I take this point so that it stretches as far as possible away from this point? It's just gonna be something that's like upward and backward here. Again, because these guys run around the rib cage, unlike these guys, which kind of just come down. I mean, of course they're on top of the rib cage in some sense, but these guys up here just come down. These guys kind of wrap around and these guys almost wrap around the most, wherein when we bring the arm upward and backward again, still nice and tight to the body, seeing how you can stretch this pretty directly with more sort of a, a narrower path as opposed to this path, right? Look at how inefficient that shortening would be for those lower fibers if I just brought the arms up here, right? So where we would wanna take these two points, boom and boom. Right, so now that we have a basic understanding of the anatomy, where things attach and what they do, we can understand, okay, how do we load these things? Because once we have those positions, the uh, trickiest part of understanding how to actually uh, grow muscle is to figure out not just the anatomy but how the anatomy relates to how we need to load the body. Okay, so starting again from top down, if we know that our upper pec arm path is somewhere here, well, all we need is a resistance and a resistance direction that is pulling the arm backward in this particular plane. That's kind of what we would call the slot for any one of these muscles is kind of a plane of motion of these joint actions. So when it comes to the upper pecs and we know, okay, here's our more stretched position, here's our more shortened position, this just looks like a number of different things. It could be a chest fly machine, uh, a dumbbell chest fly, a cable chest fly, right? Anything in this arm path where the load is pulling your arm backward, it's gonna be really, really hyper-specific to the upper pecs. And in tandem with this, we could simply say, okay, well, my arm doesn't have to be straight, like in a fly, well, my arm could be bending. Well, we know this to be a press, right? So any kind of press that is coming a little bit wider out to the side, an elbow sort of inward and toward the clavicle, that is a press for the upper pecs. And a lot of people are surprised by this because they just think that like, okay, upper pecs equals upper, so they start doing presses this way. But again, just work back from the anatomy. So we know, okay, this is, needs to be the end position. If I'm gonna do a press for the upper pecs, let's say a dumbbell press, it's gonna kind of be at a very slight low to high angle, again, with that slightly wider arm path position. Okay, and then moving down from here, right, we have something somewhat similar, at least for the upper half of these middle pecs. Right, but if we're just trying to really strike the middle, what you might think of uh, more uh, colloquially as the inner chest, right? These are the fibers that look like they're the inner chest. Um, if we're trying to strike the middle ground, again, just recall that arm path somewhere back behind the body, but a little bit tighter, ending up somewhere closer to the sternum. How would we think about this? Well, again, it could just be some kind of fly motion where we're moving from this position to this position, right? Again, most stretch position right here, most short position right here. And again, that could be on something like a uh, machine fly. It could be something like a dumbbell fly, a cable fly, et cetera. And we could also guess what? Do a press for that same kind of motion, right? So again, all of this ultimately comes down to just mimicking the motions that you know each muscle is going to create in the fully shortened and the fully stretched position. And then just saying, okay, well, if I know this is the motion I need to create, and I know that I need some kind of resistance to pull the arm backward behind the body, well, then it really just becomes a matter of what is the easiest way that I can load this in any context. And of course, there are differences between motions. A dumbbell press is different from a cable fly, right? But by and large, as long as we're just checking those boxes, the basic boxes of, am I doing an exercise that targets the right muscle? Is it stable and is it comfortable? Those are the, are the highest priority things, at least in my opinion. So then last but not least for the lower pecs, I mean, many of you know the quintessential uh, uh, lower pec exercise to be a dip. Well, why is it the quintessential lower pec exercise? Well, because Again, think about the functional anatomy we just went over, right? Arm is brought sort of tight back and up behind the body and then press downward again toward that nipple point. So if I'm doing a dip, right, and I hinge myself over, what am I doing other than just bringing attachment point and attachment point farther away from one another, right? So the most stretched position of these lower pecs is gonna kind of be an angle where we're bringing the arms upward and backward like this, and then where we're pressing forward and again toward that lower nipple. So dips, and specifically what I like to consider a sort of modified dip, is probably at the moment one of my favorite lower pec exercises. I'm also a huge fan of high to low cable flies, or if you're in some kind of um, you know machine fly, you could really just pull your chest up and aim for those lower, um, for those lower pecs, and specifically where they attach, right? But uh, all this to say that um, with the lower pec specifically, we just wanna maintain that slightly tighter arm path. We wanna be able to sort of load our shoulder upward and backward, and then we wanna be able to press downward toward that point.
So when we're organizing a training program to target each of these things and making sure that we're checking either box, I mean, it's really just going to depend on how often, you know, uh, your program allows you to hit chest, you know, what kinds of exercises you're doing. Uh, are you doing more exercises that are more in the stretch position or the short position? My personal generalized recommendation is just to start out um, uh, by looking at your total chest volume right now. Let's say you're doing eight sets a week. Well, you can keep those eight sets the same, but maybe just just divide those eight sets up between each of the specific portions. So let's say that like your upper chest is lagging, but your middle and lower chest are pretty good, but you still want these other two to grow. Four or five of your sets could be something that's just done in a little bit of a wider arm path. Maybe you do two or three sets on cable fly, two or three sets on dumbbell press, call it a day. Or if you're just combining all of your chest work into a single day, which is actually what I like to do, um, then you could just go on to do, you know, three to four more sets or something where you're doing something more at a high to low angle, whether that be a high to low cable fly, a dip, um, a low incline press, any of the things that we talked about. And as long as you're simply just checking the box of any one of these particular fibers, you're going to be good to go and you're going to see a lot of chest growth as long as you're training at or near failure, at least if you're someone who's been training for any number of years. Now, one thing that we do need to keep in mind is that anytime that the arm is back in any one of these positions and we're doing some kind of a press, all of these pecs are going to contribute to pulling the arm forward, right? It's not like when we do this wider press, let's say a wider low to high dumbbell incline press, it's not like the, the middle portions of the pecs and the lower portions of the pecs just fall off our body and, and turn off. It's just like we create a shift in the bias in the same way that you would create, let's say, a shift in bias between a lat pull down or a lat focus pull down and something like an upper back row. Of course, those are distinct motions, right? But what we're talking about is just a subtle division of attention to either one of these portions of the pecs. We're not talking about a sort of all or nothing situation. I think a lot of people will misinterpret and misread this to say, oh, if I do a press that is upper pec biased, right, there's no involvement of the middle and lower pecs, right? And if we just take that example and run with it, it's like, okay, to some degree, can these fibers and these fibers pull the arm this way up until about you know this particular point? Yes, because they sit on the front side of the joint and they can contribute to uh, what we would call a flexion moment where the arm is being pulled forward. So keep in mind that when you are in your head dividing these things up into very isolated um, uh, exercises, that there will be some overlap. And just as a general rule of thumb, the more that you do stretch focus work, so let's say something like a barbell press, a dumbbell press, a Smith machine press, the more all these will actually act and contribute together as compared to a shorter position exercise where you're, let's say, getting all the way over here or here or here, as in like cable fly motions. So if you want to be really more specific to the, just one of these portions, I would recommend some kind of cable fly motion where you, you can actually load that squeeze position. But if you're just like, ah, I don't really care what the specific bias is as much, you might just want to divide your training up into something more like, you know, a dip for the lower half, uh, and then perhaps like a low incline press for the upper half. But ultimately just play around with what combination of what motions feel good for you and see how that changes over time. And so if you enjoyed this, you want to learn more from me and you want to figure out how to actually understand this biomechanics stuff, I have a 30-day beginner biomechanics course. It's designed for the person with no experience whatsoever in any of these things. There's no textbooks, no jargon, no boring stuff. It's all just straightforward information. You can take the course in 30 days or less and you'll learn the physics of exercise, the anatomy of exercise, and then how to apply those things to lifting just like we did in this video. If you're interested in that, check the link in the description below and I'll see you all in the next video.